Um, I'm going to, thank you, Sean. I'm going to call to order the Finance Committee meeting of uh, December 5, 2019, at, um, to order at 3, excuse me, 2.40 p.m. And um, I'm going to start by um, advising um, all present that we have one person who is participating remotely pursuant to um, 940 Code of Mass Regulations 2910, and it is uh, uh, committee member Kathy Shane. And uh, I'm uh, going to ask um, if she t can let us know if she can hear us from this room, we will be needing to use the microphones, of course, but that's for Amherst Media and for Kathy to be able to hear us. Kathy, can you hear? Yes. Okay, so, um, and everybody agrees that they can hear Kathy? Yes. Then um, we've met that requirement. Um, there are, um, a couple of additional things we should notice. This will have to be included in the minutes that this remote participant and that we have included the um, information that we could hear her and she can hear us. Um, and the other thing is to just put you on notice that um, should we take a vote on any issue later during the meeting, it will need to be by roll call vote. And um, I think that that takes care of that logistical issue. So um, I'm going to immediately get into our agenda for the day because there's two items that I think are particularly important, though we have a longer agenda than that. But the first two items uh, are, the, uh, are the discussion about the preliminary financial projections for um, fiscal year 21 budget planning, the document that was presented at the meeting in which financial um, projections were presented to a joint meeting of the council, the school committee, and the library trustees. And uh, that document contained um, a proposed initial uh, budget and uh, this is uh, typical of the process that has been used for many years. Um, what would happen, and Mary Lou can add to this um, if she wishes, because she's chaired it more recently than I have, but the Finance Committee would traditionally meet even that evening or within a week um, and be able to ask questions of the Finance Director and Town Manager if the Town Manager is available about the assumptions and recommendations that he's making, and then the committee would make a decision as to um, what uh, to include in financial guidance that we wish to offer as a finance committee. And um, what we're doing now is adopting that procedure for the new uh, council format of government and uh, but we are starting at that point where we're taking the financial projections from the budget uh, planning document and the financial projections meeting and um, opening it up for questions and discussion within the council to make sure or, or in this committee to make sure that we understand and then we can move into uh, the preliminary budget guidance that we, we um, think is appropriate to give to the town manager. So um, the first item is um, to see if there's any questions or discussion about the financial projections. And uh, Sonia Aldrich is here. She has on the screen not the entire financial projection uh, document. I have that if, um, and she might also, with the graphs if people have questions about that. But in particular, what she has um, on the screen right now is the uh, pages from the actual underlying Excel spreadsheet that is presented on those two pages. I think it's like 41 and 42, roughly, of the uh, 
financial projections that have the income and expense breakdown as suggested by the town manager at that meeting. And um, because she has it as the Excel spreadsheet, she has access to underlying spreadsheet information. So, uh, and uh, we should note that uh, Dorothy Pam has now arrived at the meeting. And Dorothy, we uh, uh, just started and introduced, Kathy is participating remotely, so we have one remote participant. Watch it, watch it, watch it. <laughs> Sorry, and, uh, and we uh, just did a very brief introduction to the first topic item, but actually haven't talked about it. So with that, I will open it up to see if there are questions that people had about the financial projections presentation and the proposed budget pages. Bob? Hi, Sonia. Um, I was looking through the presentation, and um, there was a, I had a question about what the sort of employee benefit cost uh, increase has been historically? Um, prior to last year, they were increasing quite a bit because our, our, um, we were self-insured mm -hmm. and we were having a hard time keeping up with the claims that were happening. So they, they increased, I believe, almost 10% over um, it was fiscal year 18. We had already had it, um, an increase of 3%. We had to increase it three more times. So we did a whole lot of... Um, Research and went out to bid and got fully uh, looked at fully insured programs. So now we're fully insured. Last year it was a 0.6% increase, so it went way up and then it kind of went down and it's leveled off. We're not sure what the increase is going to be this year. We're assuming between 5 and 6%. I'm hoping and I'm hoping it's going to be less than that this year. We won't find that out until next month. Okay, so we will know before. We will know, yeah, yes. Because yeah. I, I, just looking at the historical, and it, I realize things have changed. Yeah. It's a, it's a uh, depending on which graph you look at, um, it either in the, the benefits or the, the debt service and fixed costs sort of doubled over 10 years. Or if you look at the other uh, chart, they went up about 50% so at the same time. So. Mm -hmm. I don't have that. I, I know. It's, it's, it, it's probably just the way you cut the, the data. Um, but um, anyway, I think that's, that to me is an, an unknown because we all know what the healthcare market is like. Um, mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll see. We should, have that, we should have that number at the end of January. I think that it's usually announced um, in general terms of, at the Mass Municipal Association Conference, and the, which is at the, uh, towards the end of January. And then I think that they send out uh, specific information to um, organization, to town, cities and towns that buy their insurance from the Mass municipal program, which is what we're doing now. Right. Uh, I just want to clarify that our employee benefits health insurance is part of our operating budget, so it doesn't stand alone outside of the operating budgets. So we get two and a half percent, I mean, we proposed, we projected two and a half percent increase for all the um, entities, town, elementary school, region, and, and we have to pay for our employee benefits within that budget. It's not outside the, those budgets. So I know some cities and towns treat it like a retirement, like a retirement assessment and it's outside that. Do we know what the Hampshire retirement plan is yet? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so what you can ask? I, I did want to ask something. Yeah. Um, we just received the retirement information. We have to do the allocations to figure out exactly how much is going to be part of this. I think it's going to be closer to 6%, a little over 6%. But we do have the numbers now. It's not on here. This, this projection won't change. This was used for the financial indicators. I'm, I've got a working copy that I'm working on. 
and um, that'll get distributed as we get more information. Sure. I did have a question about the previous question. So I've heard you say that before that you know the health insurance is in each um, uh, budget. Is can you just quickly tell us what the advantages and disadvantages of that are? Um, it's easier to it's easier to see what a department really costs with the benefits in there with it. Disadvantage. Disadvantages when we have big hikes like we did in 2018, it affected the individual operating budgets where we could have, if it was, I don't I don't really think there's an advantage or a disadvantage either way, to be honest with you. Tomato, tomato. It's going to be count, it's all still one pie and it's going to be in a different piece of the pie rather than this piece. Really? Just press hold the button while you talk. Uh, it is that part of the a percentage that they're allowed to go up by department, or is that separate? I've forgotten what how that works, but so, it could really impact a department. Right. So the town went up two and a half percent. That does not mean every department went up two and a half percent. We go through every department and see turnover. We calculate what what salaries are gonna be. We go through all the operating, some operating budgets go up higher, some go lower, depending on, on whether positions were added or deleted, reorganizations, changes like that happen all the time. Um, benefits is a separate department of itself within the town department. So it doesn't, it doesn't affect the town budgets unless we had a real deficit and there was no money anywhere else to to cover that deficit, we would have to hit all the operating budgets. It's kind of hard to. Uh, do you have a follow-up? Yes. Oh, okay, so that if, if the department has a 2.5% budget, this is not considered part of that. That, that these. The 2.5% is for the overall town budget, the total of all the departments. Oh, right. But when we break it down by departments, whether it's leisure services or whatever, that two and a half percent, that, that benefit, the percentage of that benefit is not part of their two and a half percent. They don't get two and a half percent. Oh, they don't. Two and a half percent is for the whole town entity or whole elementary school entity. Within each department, Salaries go up because of job, um, because of um, negotiations and union contracts and stuff. So salaries will change with that. So the part of that two and a half percent, the six hundred and fourteen thousand dollars up there, some of that will get eaten up by benefits. Some of that gets eaten up by the increases in salaries that we're contractually obligated to put in. Um, and then whatever's left over after all of that, that's where the town manager gets ad requests. And if we have room, we could add, if they need more in uh, vehicle maintenance or grounds maintenance, it would come from that little pile that was, that's left. So it doesn't, it's not an automatic 2.5% increase, and you live within that 2.5% increase. Operating budgets don't change. You have to request an additional additional funding from within the town, and um, personnel is automatically calculated by the finance department. I want to go back to the issue of the um, Hampshire County retirement, which I assume is very similar to the state retirement. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have a couple questions. First of all, is it true that we always only pay the same percentage regardless of the individual and when they joined the town? That in the state retirement, individuals pay a higher percentage based on when they joined. Mm -hmm. You know, so for example, my husband who was with the university since he was born, paid 5%. Yeah. I, on the other hand, paid 9%. Right. But you, do we have that same differentiation among individuals? We do. Okay, but the base we pay towards is the same for everybody. Yes. The individual pays percentage differences. 
based on when they joined the organization? It's different because the, the retirement board does the calculations okay. based on aggregate salaries as of September 30th every year. So they take that and um, whatever is paid in, it's a percentage that they come up with uh, okay. that they charge us for. So it's not 9% gets paid for you, 9% gets paid for right. For me, 5% gets paid for your husband. It's not like that. No, it's, it's 6% for everybody mm -hmm. on our bill, the town's bill. Do we have a cap on how much people can cash in on sick and vacation time when they retire? Um, we do on sick. You can only accrue two years' worth. So you can only accrue two years' worth of vacation time. Two years' worth so of you, vacation. You can only keep two years' worth on the books. Okay. And how about sick time? Um, sick time is based on um, how many days you've taken off. So you don't get paid day for, uh, for a whole day. You get paid, um, I think it's $10 a day with certain situations, $20 a day with others. If you've never used your sick time and you've participated in um, the employee health program, then it's $40 a day, but that's the max. And do we cap how much someone can receive when they retire in sick time? Yes and no. <laughs> okay. That's... It's grandfathered. I th I'm, I'm not sure which unions, and I'm not, you, this is something you, you'd have to follow up with with the HR department, but I believe some of the newer uni the union contracts have um, put caps in place for sick time, a $2,000 cap payout for new hires within a certain date or something, but like okay. I said, you'd have to Okay, uh, those are really, uh, I mean, uh, recently the university went through putting caps in. Right. And it takes which, time because you have to negotiate everything. Right, exactly. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking for questions about the financial indicators. Anything that was in the report that you had questions about, <coughs> this is your, the opportunity. Yes, Bob. Yeah, so I have a, a, a question about the ongoing capital projects. So we're increasing the capital budget to 10% of the levy, mm -hmm. and we have a long list of maintenance, et cetera, that has to happen over time. Will that 10% cover all of those additional capital expenses, or are we going to need would we need more money, you know, a greater percentage in order to cover that? Well, that's where I think um, we've been having a lot of large capital program discussions, and Sean's got that tool out there. You want to answer that, Andy? I think, yes, I believe we will need some debt exclusion overrides to do all four projects if we're going to. Uh, no, I wasn't referring to the capital projects. I was referring to the sidewalks and the. It's all part of that capital budget. One, one of the things that um, I don't, I have to go back and look at the, go, the goals, but one of the things that we have asked for this year is that we actually set a realistic five-year plan for what would, I would want to call the regular capital projects, not the big ones, okay? Uh, and that that plan, you know, be a lot more realistic than just shoving it off to the next year, which is what we generally have done. Uh, some of some people have even suggested they'd like to see tenure. Okay, the ten percent that we're trying to achieve, we're now at nine and a half this year, has been able to cover many capital projects, meaning the smaller ones, but it doesn't cover them all. I mean, we still have things out there that we aren't able to do: repairs to sidewalks, roads vehicles we aren't able to buy, things like that. However, part of what has happened is because we've been building up our reserves, when, as we go to fund the big capital investments, the four big projects, what we hope and think may happen is that we can fund two of them without an override, maybe three, but 
we will probably have to go out for an override for one, if not two of them. Okay, okay to expand a little bit, because I think I, I uh, to go back to a more basic level uh, for a second, if you, uh, the source document I would refer you to if you're not familiar with it, um, the, uh, is the financial policies that was adopted around 2007, 2008. And the financial policies, um, I can forward copies to you, but uh, for the public who may be watching uh, at some point, um, they are on the website in the budget section um, is one of the documents that's um, a supporting document. You'll find the town financial policies. Uh, if I, when we did that uh, back in uh, the time that it was done, because I was uh, involved in that process, um, we were spending around six or seven percent of the uh, amount that we measured, which is the uh, taxation revenue. Um, and uh, the, uh, we established, we recognized that we were falling behind. So we set a 10% goal. This year, if we get to 10%, it will be the first time we ever got to 10%. Um, we have always had to make hard choices. And that's what the Joint Capital Planning Committee does, and then it provides advice to the town manager about what to include to um, reach that 10% goal if we end up being able to allocate 10% for them to work with. Um, it will not be enough to do everything, and which is why the multi-year plan is an essential element um, to the process. Kathy. Kathy. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, on the uh, capital budget, the third line down is a debt assessment for the region, and it shows up for the first time in FY21. And my question is, is that the anticipated debt for the roof of the middle school? I want to know what that was. It's 292,566. Kathy, this is the first year that I've done this projection sheet completely my, myself. So I started singling out the, um, showing the region debt separately, then having it all put into the current debt number. So that's why you're seeing it for the first time in 21. And you'll see it going forward. Because it used to be all, in the past, it was lumped in the um, debt service on the sheet. And the region bills us in one single amount for all agreed upon projects. Right, right. It's an assessment. It's really an assessment, but because it, we consider it, the town considers it part of the debt and it comes out of capital because it is for capital projects over on the region side. Any follow-up, Kathy? Hearing yes. none. So, other questions? I so, I sorry, I have a follow-up. So that is for the. I believe Kathy asked if that was for the roof on the middle school. Is that? It's a combination of things. I mean, I have the breakdown, and I'm. Happy to share it with everybody, but I don't have it here, and I certainly don't have it memorized. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, each um, Mary Lou can probably help with this a little bit too. But uh, the, what happens is that there's a whole process that when the regional school committee makes a decision about what it w needs to do in the way of capital, it sends a request to the four towns. We just got one but it actually was not new appropriation. It was, uh, as I understand it, um, just reallocation of existing appropriation. 
But if there's a new appropriation, it is get, then it gets even more specific. And um, if no, if a town meeting, if if a select board wants to take it to a town meeting and a town meeting objects within 60 days of receiving it, then it's not approved. Um, but uh, I can't recall that ever happening. Once it gets in there, then um, the uh, because frequently those are just bonded expenditures, so that they're, they're being billed over time, um, it gets lumped together. And uh, so it's not just a single project, um, it's all projects. I think that Kathy's question was generated and was a logical one because it appeared to be the first time, something new, and that was a, the most recently approved item Mm -hmm. But um, actually, uh, it was, I think that Sonia answered the question beyond that. Yes, Mary Lou. There are some big items under region coming along, though, fields and a number of other things. And with the new council structure, um, is there a way that they can limit that um, or be involved in making those decisions before those requests go out to the towns. I mean, one of the things, and you and I were on this together, Andy, we really encouraged the region to come up with a capital plan because they didn't prior to that. I mean, they had items they brought to the regional school committee, but they didn't have the long range plan, which they now have in place. But there's some major items on there. So my question would be, or at least to think about, how is this going to be handled with the, the council and how are you going to review these items before they get on a warrant in the other towns? Because there is a time certain that they have to yeah. go forward. The, actually, we're in a better position in one respect because the council meets year round and it doesn't have to call a special town meeting if, uh, the, 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 um, if, if necessary to hit that 60 day window. Um, we did actually consult with town council about this question, and uh, the answer is is that the council um, has the same role that town meeting did, and there's a state statute that uh, our town attorney uh, pointed us to that um, uh, explains this, but. Um, town attorney's opinion is, is that the council has the same role as the town meetings do in other communities. And uh, the only difference is because we don't have a separate select board for if the town manager is the, brings it to the council's attention, then the council can make a decision. Um, I think that what we will probably do in those situations, though, we haven't really had one of substance because this uh, last one was just reallocation of money. But um, if there's a new um, request, uh, it would likely come for discussion at this committee to see if this committee has any advice to offer the council before the count, and then the council will have to make a decision as to what to do. Uh, so other topics because otherwise um, if there's not then we can go on to discuss the guidelines for FY21 and um, if people anybody here on the committee has further questions after as we start discussing the guidelines that um, reflect back on this information on the first agenda item. We can always return to it mm -hmm. so that there's no, you know, it's not that we have to now foreclose it forever discussion. Um, you should have a draft. Um, it is in the packet um, of a uh, memo, guideline memo, and um, it is a draft that is dated um, 12-3-19 with my initials behind it. Um, and uh, as, in, as, as some of you know, it's the fourth iteration that got to this point. What I did, and I, let me explain a little bit of the process um, so that um, 
it's, it's understood is that I took the select board um, guidelines for FY20, which were um, entitled actually um, preliminary fiscal year budget guidelines and the finance committee guidelines from last year that were presented um, by the uh, former finance committee. And I used those two documents um, and tried to make sure that I had all of the content of both documents incorporated into one document that actually read as a cohesive whole. And uh, so it was, uh, took a lot of work. The um, select board piece um, was really more about sort of overarching budget policy decisions and the finance committee did little of that but, act, but then went into more specific guidance in, about, uh, in comments about income and expenditures for the year ahead, including the allocation of how much um, each major component of the budgets, um, schools, regional schools, library, and municipal services would have. So I took the select board guidelines, and that part is under um, Roman numeral one, overall philosophy and key concerns for FY21. And uh, virtually the entire content of that is uh, from the, uh, the select board guidelines. The revenue, then um, two and three, which are revenue and expenses, are, more, are largely from the Finance Committee guidelines from the prior year. Um, the unmet budget needs is probably the, um, the, that and budget process are the newer sections where I really had to do some significant new drafting. And uh, one of the things about unmet budget needs is that um, I recognize that the council wants to be able to give some guidance um, to the, um, or, or, or suggestions of things to consider to the town manager. And I wanted to make sure that I had a section in place for that to happen. Um, in that, there is a list section that I put four items down, and I did that for the benefit of um, this group and the council itself, I, I really don't expect that list to end up looking exactly like it looks now because that really is um, something new and I was just making some assumptions so that we'd have a, um, could get a feel for language um, is, is, um, as well as some places where I thought there might be realistic content in any event based upon current discussions that are going on. And um, the budget process uh, was the adaptation to our new form of government. So that's uh, what the, this uh, document is. There was one suggestion made, uh, which I thought was a, a, a good point, and um, I can re say what it is, or I can ask Mary Lou, who made the suggestion earlier, and it was a it was merely a uh, way of phrasing things, a wording change. But I thought it was an important suggestion. So, do you want me to? Or do you want to say it yourself, or use the microphone if you do? I think that's sufficient. Okay. Um, no, it's just for the sake of everybody else who's looking, is to. Uh, try and move away from the words we, council being the, um, in this case, it's going to end up being a council document. So um, we're going to have, if I change it, it was going to have to be to the council because this is a proposed document to the council. The guidelines are going to be adopted by the council itself, but we are making a recommendation of a document for council consideration. Yes. 
I guess I had, I was, so this is a, this is to Paul Bockelman. So, and it's from the council. Yes. Correct. So it is, it, the guidelines will end up under um, our current charter. I think the guidelines have to come from the council. They do. Um, but uh, the uh, conclusion that um, she can speak for herself, of course, um, and I'm sure will, uh, but the president thought that the best way to get um, a document that the council can actually consider and work with is to get a draft to the council through this committee. And it gives this committee the opportunity to look at the, um, in particular, the budget pieces, the assumptions behind the budget and um, what it wants to recommend for council consideration. Uh, but the final document's a council document. So, Dorothy. Under um, section three, when it mentions that this budget will have a deficit of $959,511, um, I guess I'm supposed to read between the lines and that we think maybe more state money will come in, or um, I'm, I'm just not sure. Predicting a budget with a deficit while doing capital projects, I, I'm finding that confusing. Uh, let me just start with a little bit, and then I'm gonna ask Sonia to follow up, um, because Sonia has the document at hand. If you look, if in prior years, um, in prior years don't show up, this actually happened pretty much every year, that we would start with a deficit. If you look ahead in the years beyond, you see that there's a deficit line shown. By the time that um, the town manager proposes a budget to us in May, on May 1st, that has to be eliminated and um, it is a um, process to get from point from that point. There are changes. Um, we, I think that, uh, and so this is where I want Sonia to be able to add to it. Um, there are a lot of points where um, conservative, cautious estimates are made, so that we're always. Um, if, if we have errors, we're hoping that the revenue will go up or the expenses will go down um, and not the other way around. Yeah, this is the very beginning of our budget process. So we always budget, like Andy said, very conservatively. We do the um, increase the tax levy by the 2.5% allowed. And then our new growth estimate, we normally keep it at 600. Um, we've had a lot of new growth the last couple of years, and I'm pretty sure this will probably go up. How much, I don't know at this point. We won't know for a few more months down the road, so we start off with a very conservative um, estimate on that. And then all our local receipts. The only local receipt that I increase is a little bit on the motor vehicle excise. As, um, as you can see, these are the actuals over here for fiscal year 19. Some more money came in during fiscal year 19 and it will, and we, as we get more trend, we will look at these. Um, we're looking at fees during the budget process, whether some fees need to be raised or not, that'll be taken into consideration. So these will get tweaked. Local receipts will. State aid, I made no assumptions that we were getting any more than last year, which is highly unlikely, we'll probably. Last year we got two and a half percent um, increase in UGA. We'll know more about that again at the end of January. So, started with basic. Um, other financing sources, which would be the ambulance fund, I increased that very uh, minimally because we've lost revenue with um, ambulance receipts. We are in the process now of looking at ambulance um, 
fees and um, figuring out when and how much to raise those fees. So that, that might change. Uh, the problem with the ambulance reserve fund receipts is the money has to be in the account before we can appropriate it. So it might take a while to recover once we raise fees. Just point that out. Um, this is just the offsetting entry for CPA. Enterprise reimbursements, indirect costs coming from the enterprise funds. We've had some one-time revenue last year. I'm mean, for this year, the current year we're in. Too many fiscal years going at the same time here. Um, we used an assumption of 180,000 in what, the, what David calls the Hopkinton bill, which is construction in progress. So we have a big construction happening in North Square and he's estimating that um, we're going to get $180,000 and we had a deficit lot in our budget so we wanted to we use that one that one time revenue to um, bridge that gap this year I had to take it out because it was one time revenue on the expenditure side I assume two and a half percent increase for everybody this elementary school is net, ch net of charter and choice. And we're trying to get to our 10% for capital budget. And the cherry sheet assessments, I did, I left with no increase there and that will happen. We, I'm sure the assessments will go up. This is uh, our assessments for regional lockup, our retirement assessment, which we just received. I, I think this will be going down to 6%, but I'm not sure right at the moment. We, we still have OPEB at 500. So we have a lot of avenues to reduce this deficit. Maybe we can't, Maybe we can't do 10% this year. I'm, I'm pretty sure we will be able to, but at this point, it's hard to tell. So everything is just a starting point. Mm -hmm. This changes continuously through the year until we get the cherry sheet estimates from the state, the final ones. So actually, I have a two-part question that's a follow-up on what you just presented. Uh, why was North Square showing up under miscellaneous as local receipts as opposed to new growth? Because it's not new growth. It's construction in progress. The DOR considers it a non-recurring revenue and it has to be under local receipts. So it's a requirement. Will it uh, show up in FY21 then as new growth? I don't believe so because North Square has the tax incentive program, so I don't think it's going to show up right away. Well, it should show up to some extent because we didn't give away all the taxes, just gave up some of the taxes on right. a temporary basis. I mean, basis. that's a question for David Burgess when he gets back Tuesday, but. Yeah. Uh, I haven't had this discussion for a while because I haven't been on the Finance Committee for a while. Um, Sandy Pooler used to tell me that the new growth was estimated conservatively with the um, hope that it will increase as one of these items. Right, to that's help. why I have six, six, 600 up there. But this does emphasize the point of why new growth is important. Um, so, additional questions. Uh, Dorothy, did you, does that, was that sufficient? Yeah, Mary Lou. I think, uh, and I'll help Sharon help me with this. When we talked about new growth, we were relying on maybe an average over a certain number of years. Used to be the medium, 600 was the medium. Um, we've had a lot of, uh, and it pretty much still is, we've had a lot of, of good years because of all the new construction that's been going on. Let's see if I can unhide this. Let's 
So in 16, we were at 624. 17, we were at a million, but um, 400 and something of this was the Eversource Wemco infrastructure for personal property that increased. So if you, t if you were to take that out, we were still around 600. So it's, it increased a bit in 18, 19. So we start off 600 is just a safe, conservative number. Yeah, go on. So do you find this a good way to go forward is to do these averages over time? And we're talking about, notice in the letter, not only for now, but looking into the future. So do you averages find this a good trend. formula? Averages and trend, if you see it starting to tank quite a bit, then we would probably lower our estimates a bit. This gets back to the conservative estimate piece that we referenced earlier, that this is one of the lines that we, uh, that's essentially been done and recommended at this stage on a conservative basis because uh, we don't want it to go down, we'd rather it go up, but it is traditionally, which is why I was making reference back to conversations with our former finance director, who has said that over years that that has been a major contributor to reducing the, that initial projected deficit, which is what Dorothy was asking about, which started the conversation. So, yes, Shalini. In the unmet needs, um, talking about economic development, I wonder if we want to recommend to the town manager an additional position or something, because I'm looking at other towns like Burlington, for example, which are similar college towns, and they have uh, at least two to four employees working in just for economic development. You know, which is revitalizing the businesses locally and doing all the other stuff. And we have only one person right now that makes up our economic development office. So that's something to think about. How can, you know, with all the expenses and what investment can we make to further boost our economic development? Yes. Is there a budget for the economic development director? Uh, it's part of the town manager's budget. Yeah, for the sake of members of the council who weren't involved with this, uh, it was quite a, there was a period of time between when the select board and the finance committee identified the need for an economic development director until we were able to actually um, create the position. And it was sort of, it, um, not too long before John Musanti passed away that we actually were able to work it into the budget and had started a hiring process at that time and completed the hiring process that um, where Jeff Kravitz came to work for the town in that position um, was around the time that um, just before um, we hired uh, Mr. Bachelman to be our town manager. Uh, but that was a years-long process mm -hmm. to get from the conception of the need to the being able to create the position and then do the hire. Uh, and uh, uh, but I think that the question, the, the getting back to where we started from, which is Shalini's point, uh, what we could do is put into there um, a recommendation to assess whether uh, the department is adequately staffed to meet what he anticipates is the need for an economic development director and if he has uh, any recommendations regarding expansion of uh, staffing and uh, then, uh, it, but at least get it in there. And I can, if there's agreement amongst the committee I can add another bullet on that. Um, there was another bullet that I had wanted to just, since we're on the topic of additional bullets, um, we had a recommendation from the Downtown Parking Working Group um, 
that had financial implications um, because it was adding a uh, staff position to oversee the entire parking system. Mm -hmm. And uh, the decision as to whether that's going to be an exist coming from an existing position or be a new position and how much would have to be budgeted for it was not um, a part of the working group recommendation, though it was sort of implied in the um, recommendation that that discussion would have to take place. So I was uh, realizing that that could also be an additional bullet. And, of course, I expect that this, as I said earlier, I would think that this is the area that I really um, anticipate um, a healthy discussion in the council. Yeah. Yes. And this additional staff for parking could be part of the economic development department. I mean, he would be work, he could work in conjunction with Jeff or it seems like they're related issues and it would make our economic development department healthier. It could, though. Uh, uh, we have to word that carefully because I think that we're trying to talk about budget issues and uh, the administrative staffing issues really need to arise from the uh, town manager. Yes. I'd just like to add that I believe that recommendation um, from the committee, which I was on, um, oh. one of the focus points that was to have a focus point. So I think Andy's right. You know, where that fits in is not really. Um, I mean, it, it makes sense that it would be part of economic development, um, but it was also just to have a, a focal point for um, both town users and for uh, the town. And the other thing that we could put in there on the related issue, also recommended by you and the you being the working group, is um, to uh, the idea of uh, changing from an enterprise fund to a parking district, mm -hmm. and the financial implications of that. Um, to just put that in there that. Um, we would hope that the manager would give some guidance on the subject or something like that and just leave it. Uh, we don't, you know, this isn't, I was trying to word it so that um, we're not making specific recommendations, but we're um, trying to point out areas where we want thought given because we think something's important. That's the idea that I was going to try, trying to get across. Uh, then following those lines, maybe maybe just a bullet point about, uh, you know, looking at the recommendations from the downtown parking working group and some follow through on that would suffice for that bullet point and that would cover, um, that would cover mm -hmm. that nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yes. The, par the paragraph before <clears throat> about reserves. <laughs> And um, I get the idea that uh, I think one of the things is sometimes you get money, but you don't get the money up front. You have to build it, and then you then you get paid by the state if it's some of the state money. So you'd be re using reserves for upfront money. Um, and I guess I'm wondering is how low do you let it go, or is it just like some, like an aquifer where water will flow in from somewhere else that you move money around all over the place um, between the reserves and the free cash. It's, they're going to be very, very busy in this whole capital thing, but you don't let it go beyond a certain number, or is it that you just can go get some more from some other place? There is no more from some other place. <laughs> it's just what we, um, it's basically we've been, um, our policy has been to move anything over 5% of the operating budget out of free cash into stabilization because free cash goes away June 30th. You have to get it recertified again. Um, where stabilization is like a real savings account, the money's there, you can appropriate from there. Um, I don't know of any plans to take out big chunks of our reserves at this point in time, but it would, it would, the way reserves are built up is getting more revenue than you budgeted for or spending less in operating budgets. 
So that takes time to accumulate. It's not an easy fix. Shelby, I see. This is a more of a general comment. I saw in some uh, in the recommendation by the MMA that uh, they defined what fiscal sustainability is, and I thought that was really helpful for people to understand what does it really mean. And they divided it into cash solvency, budgetary solvency, long run solvency, and service level solvency. And I thought, and they gave like a little description of what each is, and I thought that was really helpful. If you might want to add that to our guidelines. That was at the uh, MMA section on budget last year, which I unfortunately didn't attend, but I can look for the uh, document because it's on the MMA website. Okay, thank you. Yes. I'd like to start on page one <laughs> and kind of go through. That's where I've made some comments. Um, at the very beginning, I have a couple on this page. Um, it's obviously addressed to the manager because he's in charge, but I'd like to suggest that the CC also go to the school committee and the library trustees. I think they need to know what the guidelines are, and also there's a lot of information in here that we assume elected officials know, but having talked to some elected officials, they don't know. Uh, especially the two and a half. So um, I'd, I'd like to suggest that this document be um, sent to them also. And, and then under uh, item uh, one, where it says municipal, I, I know this is going to the manager for town services, but he oversees evidently in the new charter the schools, or the, the, those budgets come to him, the school budget and the library budget, I'm not sure exactly what he can or can't do with them. I gather he can reduce them, but I'm not sure of that either. So when we get down to talking about um, uh, the municipal, where it says um, continued evaluation of those services and improvements to enhance efficiency and effectiveness, intense evaluation of the current range of municipal services, I would like to say school and library services, and their delivery methods is critical for ensuring that we are spending every dollar wisely. I, I guess it's not only the town that needs to be doing that. It needs to be the library and the schools. And as I say, I'm not sure what the manager's role is in those in the library and school budgets. So I'm, I'm throwing that out there. I'm not sure you all know the charter, um, so you might be able to help me with that. Uh, uh, Lynn, do you want to respond, or Howard, do you want me to try? Why don't you start? <laughs> OK. And I'll go look at the charter. Um, I think it's a work in progress in part, which is what makes it a little bit, um, because we're trying to take the charter and um, translate it to make it work. We're also looking at uh, what our neighboring communities like Northampton, that have a lot more experience with this than we do, have done because their budget charter section is almost identical to ours. And uh, I've been told by, uh, people who are on the Charter Commission, that that was purposeful um, because they rec recognized that it was working well in Northampton. Um, the, uh, my understanding of it is, is that we're still in the same place that, um, as, in, as they do in Northampton, that the school committee develops the school budget and proposes the school budget to the mayor. The mayor then um, includes the school budget, which covers their high school too, because they are just a K-12 district. Um, and so the entire um, education budget, which I've been told is in two parts, um, the other part being the vocational school is actually a separate budget. Um, but the two school budgets, 
um, go through the mayor then um, in the mayor's recommended budget to the council. The council has exactly the same role. If you look at their charter and our charter, what happens from the mayor's recommendation to conclusion um, and what happens from the town manager's recommendation to conclusion are, um, it's almost, you know, it's, it's virtually the same language. Um, the, uh, uh, so I, I, I think that the manager uh, under our, under the way that we have now structured it, would not want to get into um, trying to make second guess decisions once they've been um, approved by the school committee of what the school budget should be. Um, the total amount, of course, um, is started with this process, which is not dissimilar to what existed in the prior form of Amherst government. Um, and, but this is very much still of the details of um, work in progress. I think the suggestion of making sure that the language of we recommend that services, um, including um, all things funded by the town, be reviewed on a regular basis is a really good suggestion and it's a good way to handle that. Um, but um, we're still working at it. So Lynn. And so the charter, I mean, both the library trustees and the school committee have to approve their budget that then comes to the town manager. But as Andy just stated, it starts with sending a message one direction that says, this is what you have, okay? And, or this is what you should use as your guideline. And then they come back and they present a budget that is in the guidelines. Ultimately, you know, it comes to the council. The town manager delivers it later than it, they used to deliver it because um, the manager delivers it to us no later than May 1st. And we must approve it no later than June 30th. Uh, and, but we have very strict um, guidelines, if you will, or charter uh, pieces, which basically say, you know, we can't, by the time it gets to us in May, we're not in a position to start sending new messages to the town manager. If we're gonna start mucking around, then we have to, you know, it's an eye for an eye. What are you gonna take out? What are you gonna put in? And what are you allowed to do and not allowed to do? So. Yes, go um, ahead. I, I think this is a, a preliminary budget guidelines in that, I, well, we've used that in the past because what it implies is that in the future, if revenues fall short, whether from the state or our own, that we can change those. And that's, that's why we use preliminary, I think, in all the old uh, documents that you see, it says preliminary. And with the understanding that these are in place, but should something unforeseen happen, we might have to go back and say, you have to reduce by so much. Yeah, and I actually gave a lot of thought to that question when I was doing the draft, and I didn't use preliminary because um, we really have a very different budget process now, and this is a one-shot opportunity. If, um, the, I guess the best way to, say it is to go a little bit back onto what's the difference between the two forms of government and how the budget was handled. Um, the budget belonged to the legislative branch town meeting it, to a larger extent than it does now under the council form of government. Mm -hmm. And um, so under the old form of government, uh, the manager would make recommendations on what is essentially what we're doing now, the guidelines. Um, the guidelines were put in as preliminary because the finance committee wanted to have the opportunity to make changes to the document um, and to the budget because the decision of what budget to go to take to the town meeting, the legislative branch, was being made by the finance committee and that was the role of the Finance Committee. 
under our new form of government, it is the town manager um, who is making the uh, recommendation of the budget in making the decisions on what budget to present to the council. And the council then, um, so that um, the finance committee doesn't have the same role and um, therefore um, the council, not only does the finance committee not have the same role, but the council doesn't have the same role. The council can't change anything. Um, as a matter of fact, all we can do is give, guide, is, is give recommendations. Um, and uh, so that's essentially why the process is so different. And um, there, was, there really was no room for any changes to the guidelines once the council adopts them under our new form of government. So using the word preliminary didn't make sense, so I dropped it. Yes? I kind of understand where Mary Lou's coming from with this because this is preliminary. This, you're basing the guidelines on this projection, and that's very preliminary, so it will change. It will so change. So maybe I'm but, misunderstanding the concept. But, but the, pro the, qu the problem is this. Let's assume that um, there's a change up or down in state aid. That's mm -hmm. always the area that we're most concerned about. Mm -hmm. um, whichever direction it goes, it's going to affect the amount of money that is available for each of the major components of the budget, each of those major functional pieces. Um, the council won't have the opportunity to go back to say to the manager, it can, you know, through the finance committee, we might give different advice after hearing from the BCG, but it is really the decision of the um, town manager as to what to do about that increase or decrease, um, and which is different from the prior form of government where the finance committee had to make an adjustment of what it could send to town meeting because it had to send a balanced budget to town meeting. Now it is the manager who has to do that. And uh, so we can give additional guidance if we wish, but it's a whole different form. Yes. So you're saying that, let's say we get a windfall from the state. Uh, the manager can use that in whatever way he chooses to, to add things to the budget or put it in the reserves that, that doesn't come back to the council that you have this windfall now from the state? I'm just curious how that works. I think that we can make an additional recommendation and maybe you are hitting on, on a good point uh, because maybe we should indicate that we may come in with additional guidelines if uh, there is sufficient, if there is significant additional information. But the decision um, of what to recommend, um, whether to recommend that they go to one of the major functional areas or they go to reserves, will be the decision for the manager to propose, not for the finance committee to propose, as it would have been under the old form of government. I guess my point about the preliminary part of this is that we're using this projection. You um, state 2.9% increase in overall budgets, in, overall, in the overall budget, but that's gonna change. It's gonna change um, once I update the retirement, it might go down, so I see this as preliminary guidelines and not really permanent guidelines. So should we do this by saying your guidelines as of such and such a date? Right. This is the information we have at right. this point in time. Um, I do believe in the, I'd have to look at the section, but in one of the later sections of the draft, we've highlighted a few things that we would like to see addressed the extent to which they can be addressed may depend on the extent to which the money can be found. If we wanted to now say 
you know, the $15, $15 an hour, for example. Um, you know, maybe we can only go to 14. State law doesn't require we get to 15 till a certain date. Uh, and it's not this year. Uh, so if maybe what we want to add to that list now or be thinking of things we would add to that list. Um, but that would, for me, be a, a heads up to the town manager if the, if the council approves these guidelines, that would be a heads up to the town manager. Hey, you get some extra money. This is where we want to see you come forward. Yeah, I... Just to answer, typically if we do get more money than we're estimating in our, in our revenues, it normally falls to undesignated fund balance and it becomes part of our free cash calculation. Unless it's something comes up during the year that the town manager and before the tax rate is set, because once the tax rate is set, you can't spend revenues that come in. It has to be a funding source that's already there, like free cash that's been certified or a stabilization fund. So he couldn't just add things to the budget if more money came in once the tax rate is set. It's, um, and of course, there's a provision in the charter if um, he's recommending additional expenditures to us after the budget on May 1st, it essentially is a supplemental budget. And it goes through a process like the May 1st budget. We've done that a couple times on a couple different points. Mm -hmm. Yes, Shalini. I'm, I'm just, yeah, just So, mm -hmm. we are learning, yes. Want to go to page two? Go ahead. Uh, I'm just wondering, uh, in the very uh, last sentence of that first partial paragraph, um, it would say, uh, uh, levy limit and some growth in state aid may allow us uh, to remain within the limits of Proposition 2.5. Wouldn't we allow us to, uh, no, re allow us to something about the uh, property tax to remain within the limits of 2.5? would allow the property tax to remain within the limits of Proposition 2.5 requirement. See the very last sentence there on top of page 2? Yes. Um. Yeah. About new growth that provides new tax revenues in addition to the allowable 2.5 increase in the levy limit and some growth in state aid have allowed us, uh, have allowed the property tax to remain within the limits of the two and a half requirement. Isn't it the property tax? Yeah, that's a good point. It goes back to the uh, prior point you raised about uh, trying to get away from pronouns. Well, I, just, uh -huh. I think it makes more Yeah, no, I, 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 th I think that it, it's, it's a clearer statement. I, I haven't <laughs> noted on it. Okay. Uh, and one of the things, and I don't think it needs to be in here, but we did, um, if you read our finance committee report, we did put in what two and a half means or how it works. Mm -hmm. And I just wondered if that could, the manager certainly knows, but I think there are committees that do not. So it, it might be an attachment for school committee and library trustees. I know um, I was speaking a couple years ago at the, fi at the school committee meeting, and, and some of them had no clue what two and a half meant. And we're, you know, moving along, although the tax rate has gone down for this coming year. It, we're still moving along. And even though it goes back, it slowly moves forward. And we're not, you know, it's 25. And we're at 21, it's 13 or 18 this year. But anyway, so I, I'd like to suggest that even, I wouldn't put it in this document, but I would make it an attachment for the people who receive this, just so they understand two and a half as they plan their budgets. Okay. Um. I can consider a brief, uh, 
statement to append and see if I can make it work and we can also um, then make it by reference, get to an item that's on the town website, which is the um, Department of Revenue um, piece about explaining two and a half. Yeah. But uh, that's really where you get the best explanation. Other things? Yes, Bob. Yeah, so on the same page, when a couple paragraphs down, where we talk about the, the other capital projects, uh, maybe I would recommend that we put in an explicit you know, recommendation to develop a five-year capital plan, or however we want to phrase that. It's, it's in the charter already. It is in the charter. Okay. Yes, the charter requires that there be a five-year plan, and uh, the, uh, that's been long-term town practice uh, so I don't think that uh, it needs to, to be there as an, um, because we already we're already required to do that I, um, another suggestion later on, on on page five where you enumerate the unmet budget needs um, the first Point, you know the, the level staffing for fire EMS services and um, I think it would be beneficial to get a better understanding of you know how much the student population writ large impacts the activities of the fire and EMS services I don't think there's a real good handle on that and I think there's a kind of a definitional issue about you know, if you go to a, a house, even if it's a rental house for students, it's just considered the town population. Mm -hmm. So, and, and I don't want to get into, you know, um, improper things, but I, I think it would be very helpful to know mm -hmm. where, you know, our firefighters and EMS uh, technicians are spending their time. Yeah, let me answer the question a little bit, and Sonia might be able to add to this. Um, Tan hired a consultant a few years ago who helped do a very thorough analysis of fire EMS staffing, and it was presented to the um, select board at the time um, by the consultant who did that services. Um, the uh, finding was is that um, it was not the students that were driving the increase in EMS calls, that actually our fire calls have gone down in proportion to total calls and our EMS calls have gone up, and that the largest driver of that is the aging of our population, not the students. Mm -hmm. so, so what you so it's interesting. I think you were at the second listening session, or the first, the first one. This question was asked there, and we do have um, a series of maps over the years that show and and line graphs. I'm actually trying to get them now so that we can post them. Uh, and, but what you really do see is and, and this kind of gets at your issue, but it's hard to explain uh, or hard to nail down. Let me just say, what you see is major call areas, particularly for EMS, to places like Applewood, the apartment complexes the campuses, and so forth. Now, for instance, on the apartment complexes, are those UMass students? Yeah, maybe they are, maybe they're not. It just, it's wherever you have concentrations of age, <laughs> I hate to say it, or youth, um, you tend to have more ambulance calls. And as Andy said, ambulance has continued to go up while fire has gone down because of all the retardants and sprinkler systems and stuff like that. Yes. Along similar lines, do we have numbers for how many students are going to our schools from uh, tax-free housing, like UMass-based? And I mean, I think if we have more accurate numbers of the services that we are providing to UMass, faculty or students and so forth, I think the stronger our case can be. Does that mean? Yeah, if, I, if I, 
faculty li for UMass at least, uh, yeah, live in their own yeah. houses, they pay their own taxes, and so they're already contributing to the schools. Um, the, there is a study that was done uh, about two years ago that looked at the um, university housing and the number of students in those schools, and there has been, as recently as just this last week, a newspaper article that suggests there is some discussion about compensation for, regarding that. A couple other things. I mean, this is a very complex topic, obviously, um, and uh, the, uh, I, I'll have to speak for Kathy. Um, I don't know if she's still on the call at this point or not, um, but uh, Kathy had been actually giving some good thought to this question and has raised a bunch of questions that have been passed along to the town manager, um, but the uh, university is giving us a significant piece of money, several hundred thousand dollars for, um, and actually came in two chunks for um, ambulance and fire services. And um, they actually increased it because, uh, a couple of years ago, recognizing that there were high um, demand weekends that at the beginning and end of semesters, essentially, or beginning and end of the school year, where the um, need was greater. And uh, that caused, so, so we are getting from the university um, actually a, 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 a chunk of money. The question is, is it an adequate chunk of money? And I think that that is something that the town manager is now involved with looking at in discussions with the university on um, the um, strategic partnership agreement, which is where the payment of money from the university to the town for services the town provides to the university comes from. Uh, the other thing that about EMS services that's a very difficult topic is that we, um, of course, can bill for um, health insurance or Medicare if there's a transport to hospital. And um, so that when we make an EMS call, we actually receive revenue for it. And um, you know, Sonia can provide details if you want details on, them, on it. But um, in general terms, that's always been a fairly significant piece. Um, the one place that it doesn't um, we don't get compensation for is if um, somebody calls from one of those facilities that um, has a number of particularly um, debilitated elderly population or any population really. And what really happened was that the person fell out of bed and it doesn't involve, in the end, a transport to the hospital because it's really a lift and assist need to get the person back into bed. At that point, we've made an EMS call for which we have no additional compensation coming in because that's not billable to anybody. And that's another issue that um, I think we're looking at um, to see what we can do about um, to address that question. Um, but uh, it, it, it's a uh, very big topic. Especially, when, especially since um, facilities such as Applewood, in the past, they used to have train their people to lift people if they fell. They aren't allowed to do that anymore. And it's, it's created this incredible eking into the emergency system. It's actually a facility that's not Applewood that's the biggest problem, but <laughs> yes. Uh, <clears throat> under schools and, and students and UMass, um, a couple of years ago, and I don't know if this is, the number is still correct, but they had 50 children who lived in non-taxable student housing. The, the, um, Per pupil cost is, I believe now, $21,000 a student. You multiply the 50 times 20,000, 
and you get a million dollars. Many of these students require English as a, uh, as a second language. And so, so for many of them, they probably get more services and should. Um, so that small bit they give us toward fire and ambulance, and that's welcomed. But I think part of the negotiation on page three uh, should be that it includes not only um, payments in lieu of taxes for the ambulance, but it should include town and school. On the second full paragraph, second line, it says uh, they encourage the manager to do this uh, to help defray some of the costs of the town and schools um, that they incur. Um, and, and, and one other thing on that page then. The uh -huh. other would be the third paragraph down. Um, I'd like a more active... I'm suggesting that we be more active in uh, requesting that the state look at the funding for charter schools and choice, choice out charter especially. They're going to stay with us. There has to be a better way to uh, finance them without, well, Amherst, because of its, its high per pupil, per pupil cost, has to pay a higher amount than, let's say, if you have uh, children from Hadley, they, their per pupil cost is lower, so they pay less. So I think that there has to be uh, some activity on the part of the council or the manager um, and the schools to continue to push for better funding for charter schools so it doesn't take away from our public schools. Uh, you were touching on two subjects, and let me uh stay with where you are right now, you distinguish between, char there's charter and there's choice. They're two different things, of course. And you're, you're suggesting both. You use the term choice out, and of course, our, we pay choice out if somebody goes to another district, we pay, we receive choice in. I think we have more choice in students than choice out students. Well, I was trying to, I was comparing students who leave the district. So choice out and charter, we have to pay that. If they, if they figure out how to pay more for choice out, we'll get that because they're gonna choice in. But, but for now, I, I'd like us to continue to push in those areas to um, lessen the burden on the public schools. Uh. Let me see if I can work that. I, I should be able to work that in, and I might just be uh, charter and choice and leave it at that because getting into the in and out question may be too difficult. Um, as far as the prior one that you talked about with the, uh, the university, and uh, that was actually in the prior strategic partnership agreement, the one that just expired, there was a provision in there that required the university to work with us to make it the study that Lynn referred to. And um, so now that we've had the study, the question is what to do about it. And um, the, uh, I think that it is in current discussions, but we can reinforce that. That's, that's fine, a good addition. Other things? Because then, otherwise, what I'm going to do is summarize where we're at, what we've done, and then see if we want to take a vote to recommend that this go to the council with those changes having been drafted in. I will work as quickly as I can to draft them, send them to you so you see what I did, but um, I'm not going to be able to uh, do so before. Uh, we're not. We are not going to have, be able to have a discussion at another meeting unless we decide um, to schedule a meeting for the purpose um, to do it. Um, but uh, we talked about um, either using terms of preliminary um, guidelines or making the point that we may provide additional guidelines if additional information becomes available. Um, on the CC line at the beginning to add school committee 
and library trustees as recipients. Um, we talked about um, in the services um, area when we talk about um, evaluating um, cost effectiveness of services to make sure that that includes all services that are funded by the town, not just municipal services. Um, we talked about um, attaching and something to explain two and a half um, in possibly with a brief introduction in the document referring to the attachment. Um, there was the um, making sure that uh, the words property tax are added at the beginning of, near the beginning of page two. Um, uh, strategic partnership agreement to say something more specific about um, schools. Um, we were, uh, those recommendation that we have charter and choice being added to the school language. And um, on the list, uh, let's see, um, the uh, question of unmet budget need, um, that, uh, or were, there was, uh, the suggestion was to, to incorporate the uh, um, language from the Mass Municipal Association um, conference section that Shalini was referring to, um, and I was gonna try and look for that document. And okay, uh, she's, uh, we already have it, so uh, to see if that can be in some way incorporated some of that. Um, the uh, um, possible expansion with a little bit more explanation of the kinds of things that might be useful for the council to know, because remember this is a council document. It's not a, that we're, it's not gonna be a recommendation. Though we could say there would be, uh, but something about getting more information about fire EMS service breakdowns. Um, for example, um, the effect students and elder population have on it and whether there's anything that can be done. Um, the um, possible increase in economic development staffing by asking for an evaluation of the um, economic development, putting in something in that list about downtown parking working group. So those are the changes that I will do some drafting on, and uh, then I would uh, um, like to see if somebody would like to make a motion that we send uh, proposed guidelines to the council um, in the um, as drafted with the change with the changes that have were discussed at this meeting incorporated in the next version of the draft that goes to the council. I move that we send the draft with the amendments to the council for their review of, at their December 16th meeting. Is there a second to the motion? Second. So is, uh, second the motion is, the motion was um, made by Lynn, seconded by Shalini. Um, and uh, don't, is there any further discussion? I don't think there needs to be. After, after we vote, I have two other things I just want more clarification on, but that will be after the motion. So okay. So um, do we still have our remote participant? Yes, we do. She's ready to vote. Okay. Mm -hmm. So. Um, before we vote, um, are there any additional comments or um, suggestions about that would be offered to the um, council members from the three resident members who aren't able to vote? I just want to make sure that you have that opportunity. Um, so then um, I'll uh, just go in order from around um, around the table and I'll save my vote for last. Lynn? Um, yes. Shalini? Yes. Dorothy? Yes. yes. Kathy? Yes. 
Kathy said yes, and I voted yes, so it's five to zero. Uh, Dorothy, did you have anything else before we go on to the last few items on the agenda? On, on page three, um, first paragraph, pursuing solar power generation, other green initiatives will contribute toward greenhouse gas emission, reducing adopt the climate action goals, and it's this next part that I just, it seems awfully big. Our opportunities for economic development Oh, our opportunities for economic development to support future budgets. Does, is that referring to making a money-raising solar farm? I mean, I don't know what it's referring to. Uh, that was actually language that was um, adapted from the select board guidelines that um, were the prior guidelines and with some modification. I think that the... Uh, um, generate, it can come in one of a couple of ways. One is the way that you suggested that um, there might be some economic development potential within um, solar generation if it is privately developed. Um, and the, um, I've, I, we know that um, Cinda Jones has installed solar and um, it actually has a, um, a taxation benefit um, because it's um, uh, and we also know that it's being proposed for Hickory Ridge and um, we will receive property taxation for the value of the equipment um, and uh, the other is of course it produces revenue which reduces budget to the extent that they're our solar um, so it, it, they're, they're two different pieces. So if there's any, nothing else on that, um, I just want to turn back to the agenda for just a moment. We have not been able to get back to the affordable housing priorities policy, and I think uh, we probably will do that at the meeting on the 17th. Um, it's going to be quite a... Um, challenge to do this if anybody wants to offer to volunteer to help me send me an email after or see me after but I'm going to try and take that last document that we did and start working it towards an actual memo that we can see if we can report back I think we're not going to be able to get additional information but we certainly want to look at it but it is a our goal is to look at it from the financial perspective, not the housing policy perspective, but they're not entirely separate issues, and we can only pull them apart as far as we can actually pull them apart. So I put it on the agenda so that if people wanted to say more about it now, they could. Um, but um, that was the, the reason, and uh, I anticipate this being a more significant item at our next meeting. So if there's nothing else, I'm just pausing to see if there's anything else on that. Um, Kathy, do you want to say anything or do you want me to report on where we are with the percent for arts bylaw? Um, can, if, can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Uh, we will be sending finance and CRC a revised byline with a comparison uh, memo that tells you what was changed. And it should be ready to start reviewing on the 17th if there's time on that agenda. And of course, what we'll, we'll, we will want to do as a finance committee, and Kathy is in sort of that dual role of being the chair of the um, uh, work, the group, the, the ad hoc committee, thank you. And uh, but also a member of this committee, um, uh, our um, focus will be largely on looking at the financial implication piece of it. Um, though again, it's going to be hard to pick it apart entirely. Anything else you want to say on it, Kathy, or shall I go on? I think that's fine, Andy. Just the heads up. Yep, and that's really all that we're doing. Um, I put on their agenda without any knowledge as to whether there would be anything to say on it, but report on the December 3rd 
major capital investment listening sessions. Um, I know I saw Bob at one. I've seen, I think I saw all council members in at least one. Um, I think Sharon, you were at one, weren't you? No. Uh, but I thought they, they, were, they were good, and I think they provided we, a lot of useful information. Lynn. Yeah, I think, you know, the weather might have cut back on the number of people, and certainly the change of location may have hurt us a little bit. Having said that, we had about 35 people at each of the listening sessions. Uh, and of those, those 35 people who were not on boards are part of staff. So actually, most of the time, there were about 70 people in the room because of the people on boards and on staff. So um, we've gotten very positive feedback about the video. And uh, we are actually looking at how we can expand, perhaps through district meetings and other meetings um, in key locations for underserved populations where we might expand how we reach out to people. And, and we have another one, two others on the 9th, uh, one at Fort River and one at Wildwood. So if you haven't gone to one, they're interesting to go to, so try and get to one if you can. If not, um, there is a now a web page, uh, just amherstma.gov slash capital, that has the video that was presented um, as the beginning of that, which is excellent. It has uh, descriptions from uh, the superintendent, the um, library director, the fire chief, and the DPW superintendent that were all really well done with slides that um, explain the services provided and what the building limitations are and what the problems are. So if you don't get a chance to go, certainly take a look at the website, the, the web page that I referred you to, I guess the town website slash um, capital. And um, it's under the government section if you're trying to just find it from a tab. The um, Tina has a hand up. Hmm? Kathy. Does Kathy have a question? She just had a comment that minutes are available posted with the Finance Committee up to date. Um, one of the members had a, a question about the minutes, so they're online now. Okay, so the minutes are posted uh, up to date. So um, thank you, for Kathy, for um, letting us know to say that. Um, just going through the uh, next uh, two agenda items, again, really quickly, because so we can adjourn. Um, the budget process and finance committee um, schedule, I think we pretty well now know where it is that um, assume that we will be twice a week during the month of May so that as soon as we get the May 1st budget that we have the opportunity to start meeting um, with uh, the uh, department heads on what's in the municipal budgets. And the guidelines have already made a suggestion, as you probably saw, that um, once the trustees and the school committee have adopted budgets that we um, get reports um, possibly from the superintendent and library director earlier so that we don't have to do those in May because there's no reason that they have to wait until after the budget if they've already been approved if the manager is agreeable to that. Um, so I've made that recommendation through the guidelines. Um, there is no public to make public comments, so that can be just noted in the uh, minutes. And um, the last item is that um, a matter unanticipated. Um, there, um, I sent, I believe, <laughs> I'm getting so lost, the committee charge. And we are going to um, need, we've been asked by the um, GOL committee that approves committee charges that wants to review functioning of all committees to see if we have any recommendations on changes of charges. And, the, and uh, of course, they're asking for us specifically about the finance committee charge. 
Um, that will be on the next agenda. This is really just a heads up. The additional piece that I wanted to just say to you so uh, that you'd be aware of it is one of the things that GOL talked about this week and told me um, about yesterday is that um, there's a suggestion was made of um, combining the audit committee into this committee so that we would function as an audit committee in addition to a finance committee. Um, and uh, I um, will want to take that up for discussion at the next meeting. And if we did so, um, whether we would recommend that the three resident members for the purposes of services and audit committee, whether it be separated out, can be separated out to allow votes um, for all members of the committee, um, since it is not the finance committee as specified in the charter, but an expansion of the finance committee. It's a difficult issue. I don't know if it's possible, but I think that we ought to um, talk about both pieces of that um, when we get to it on the 17th. And I wanted to say it today to alert you to the issue so you have some time to think about it. Um, Yes. The, um, the old finance committee thing sent one person to the audit group, and I don't know who else had members there. Sonia may know. Um, but yeah, I we do. only <laughs> had one person go. Um, could be two. So I, I, are you suggesting that even if it's not the non-voting residents, that all five of you go to an audit committee meeting? I mean, that's a lot of work. I mean, it's just, it's not a lot of work, it's just a lot of time. It's actually, uh, the flip side of it is that, um, and this is the subject of the discussion next time, so I, I think that it's important um, to get there. And um, the audit committee, having served on it for um, myself for a number of years, um, really is just a couple of hours um, in the morning, one, once a year, meeting with the auditor and having the auditor go over the audit report. The, um, of course, you get the report in advance, you want to spend time looking at the audit report before you get to the meeting so that you have some familiarity um, with it before you go in. Um, but, uh, Lynn. The uh, other charge, however, to the audit committee is they must come up with a process, and I know Sonia is working with the president audit committee on this, by how we choose an auditor. Well, that gets, we're a little hamstrung on this because there's really only two audit firms that serve Western Mass, and I don't think we want to pay a bundle more money just to have somebody trundle out from Eastern Mass to do our audit, and so I think uh, but there is a committee that is doing the audit guidelines. Who, on, who is on the audit committee from the finance committee? Dorothy. Okay. So that's how we handled it this year. The, the charter allows us at any time to look at how we're organized for our standing committees. And, you know, we all kind of rushed into that as of December of last year. And some people are now standing back and saying, do we want to... Um, tweak committee charges. There's another piece, Andy, that I've also been hearing, and that is that things such as the housing stuff might not come to us. And I have mixed feelings about that because when it comes to issues like the cost of implementing the sustainability uh, and we start having to make choices between whether or not we um, construct new buildings that are zero energy or as close to zero energy as we can get, or we renovate, which doesn't require, those start eking into things that I think are clearly and completely financial. Uh, they may have philosophical, clearly, but I, there's other pieces to that. And then one other piece, and let me just share this. I, I am very active in two nonprofits. One nonprofit keeps a separate audit committee. I, that's the Girl Scouts of Central and Western Mass. 
and they, their bylaws do not allow them to have an audit committee be part of their finance committee. The other nonprofit that I'm very active in is the Survival Center, and the Finance Committee is the Audit Committee. And so having talked to both sets of auditors, I have never been able to get a clean answer that says it's fine either way or it's not fine either way. It's, it, it's the practice is done either way. Yes, uh, Sonia. I just want to throw out there that our, our audit committee has typically been a representative from the school, uh, finance committee, um, library trustees. If it's going to be the finance committee, how do they interact with that? Yeah, um, that's sort of, uh, but, but of course now we have a finance committee that's entirely council. Right. And so that the um, trustees in the school committee are not represented on the current finance, uh, current audit committee. And that's another issue that um, I did alert GOL to as we get into this question about audit committee that um, you know, maybe we should get back to that. And it's particularly important because um, there are elements of both that I think are audited. Um, and um, so it makes sense for them to be represented. But, um, Let's leave it at that. This was uh, put on as, this is an unanticipated item. I am loath to have significant discussion about items that have not been posted um, in advance because then there's no public notice for it. And as a matter of open meeting law um, compliance, I think it's best practice not to do that if you can avoid it. And so I wanted to just, this was really to, raise the issue, but not to have the discussion. So I, I won't discuss it. I just want to clarify then. Is this suggestion uh, of having the resident members have a vote on the audit committee, is this from you or is it from GOL? Uh, it's from me. It was not from GOL. Uh, it, 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 it was a question that sort of as I thought about how you would apply it, it is something that could be explored. Um, if we wish to do so. So with that, I think I'm out of items unless somebody else has something they didn't anticipate. Mary Lou. Just quick, um, in looking at my calendar, you have a meeting on the 16th, and you're asking us to come from 6.40 to 6.45 as some kind of vote, but since we don't vote, are you really serious mm -hmm. about our coming for five minutes on the night of the 16th? I think that it depends upon what you'd like to do. Um, you're part of the committee, and um, so I want to, you know, certainly um, don't want to have you be excluded from it. Um, every meeting you have that choice as to whether to come or not. Um, the If you're coming, though, I would urge coming at 6.30 for the, uh, because if there is any public comment about the proposal for Kendrick Park, the purpose is we've made a recommendation and it's only a question of, we said we would reserve the opportunity to modify our recommendation based upon what we hear from the public and that would be the sole, that would be the discussion. So. Um, I, it's in, for each of the three of you and for the entire, for all of us, it's always in our decision yeah. as to whether we come. 6.30 is the required public forum when we're going to spend money outside the general budget cycle. And there'll be about a three to five minute presentation. You've seen it, but that's when we're required to do 50% of the time is the public comment. Oh, and if nobody here is, is here to comment, then we just look each other at each other for that amount of time. Uh, and we do we have reserved this brief period of time for the finance committee if we have anything we want to change about our vote that we do. That's it. So anything else? If not, then uh, I'm just going to declare us adjourned at. 435, and thank you very much. It's been a very helpful meeting. Thank you.